Now, my hi to my and welcome to you all joining us here this morning. So today we're looking at how to keep our tamariki safe from choking and strangulation in the home. Here with us today from the Safe Kids team, we have myself, Laura and Moses. So Safe Kids Aotearoa is the injury prevention service of Starship Children's Health, dedicated to reducing unintentional preventable injuries to tamariki aged 0 to 14 years old in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, for those of you who haven't already connected in with us on social media, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and we also have a new Safe Kids website, uh, so you can check that out. Um, and the site's just up there on the slide there, which you will have access to uh, if you are signed up and registered for the webinar. Okay, so with today's topic of preventing choking in the home, we're going to be focusing in particular on under fives. Uh, is that at the biggest risk for unintentional uh, injury related to choking, suffocation or strangulation? We're also going to look at some choking hazards in the home, our priorities for action, and hopefully overall just sort of add to your kete of tamariki home safety knowledge with our key messages and safety tips. Now, as we go through the national data and look at some of the statistics around suffocation, choking and strangulation, I really do want to emphasize that when we're talking about injuries today, we're using the definition of an injury that results in at least 24 hours in hospital or may result in a fatality. These are really serious injuries and we want to do everything we can to, protect, uh, to prevent them. Now, looking at all unintentional injuries, Data illustrates that in Aotearoa, these injuries result in 140 hospitalizations per week and one death per week. These hospitalizations and deaths can be reduced if we're more aware of the risks and prevention strategies around keeping our tamariki safe. Now, often people still refer to unintentional injuries as accidents. And something that's really useful to keep in mind is that over the past 25 years, the data has illustrated that what we might often call accidents are often in fact preventable, even if they are unintentional. Safe Kids is all about raising awareness so we can access more strategies and support to keep our tamariki safe and out of hospital. Just looking at this injury pyramid here. Now, this is a representation of the demand on the health sector caused by injuries and violence globally. Many international studies suggest that community incidents, which is represented in the yellow, purple, and gray below the blue line, is much higher than hospital admissions, which makes sense. The data injury categories that Safe Kids focuses on, and thus the data that we're sharing with you today, are fatal injuries, as represented at the top of the pyramid in the teal light blue color, and injuries resulting in hospitalizations, as represented in the pink. Now, 60% of hospitalizations occur in a home environment in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which makes sense as we spend a lot of time in the home, especially as a child. The home definition here includes the garden and driveway. We know that unintentional preventable injuries are the third leading cause of death in New Zealand, with medical issues being the number one leading cause and sudden unexpected death in infancy, or SUDI, being the second highest. Sudden unexpected death in infancy is in a category of its own as the numbers are so high and the data classification is so complex. We'll touch briefly on SUDI shortly. Now, research suggests that there is a socioeconomic gradient to unintentional tamariki injuries, meaning that with more poverty and a financial hardship comes more risk. We also see that Māori and Pacific populations are more at risk for tamariki unintentional injuries, something we also see highlighted in the data on injuries related to suffocation, choking and strangulation. Here we're just looking a little bit more in depth at ethnicity factors and what this looks like on a rates per 100,000 basis. Dala illustrates that Māori are significantly more affected by unintentional injuries than anyone else in Aotearoa, with a mortality rate 3.5 times that of non-Māori tamariki in the same age group. Pacific Island non-fatal injury rates are also very high. Now, uh, highlighting these disparities can be problematic in some ways, but it's really helpful um, to, for, us, for us to kind of know where to channel support and resources on more of a structural sort of level. Um, 
And, and highlighting these sort of uh, disparities also challenges us to ask why they might exist. For example, to factor in, uh, factor in structural and systemic discrimination, and also to emphasize the importance of culturally appropriate health interventions. So the data is pretty clear for this one. For Tamariki age zero to uh, 14 years, injuries are happening at home more than in any other environment, as you can see in the far left column. And of these Tamariki home injuries, more than half are aged under four years old, as you can see in the dark blue section of that far left column, representing ages zero to four years. Ages five to six are represented in the light blue teal color, and ages 10 to 14 are shown in yellow. The home is where we're seeing the most tamariki injuries happen. So we know that we need to be just that extra bit more mindful with our tamariki when they're with us at home. Okay, so looking specifically here at some choking, strangulation and suffocation data. Now, when oxygen flow to the lungs is reduced or blocked completely, brain damage can occur in as little as four to six minutes. Long-term effects vary from person to person, but are often life-changing and debilitating. Long-term repercussions can include cognitive, behavioral, and physical disabilities, along with significant social and financial costs, not to mention a loss of quality of life for the child affected and for their whanau. Here we're looking at the different types of choking, strangulation, and suffocation that can lead to serious injury. Ages 10 to 14 years are represented in yellow, ages 5 to 9 in teal, and ages four, uh, 0 to 4 years in dark blue. We can see that the little ones ages 0 to 4 are by far the most likely to experience a choking or suffocation leading to hospitalisation, with the only area where they are not overrepresented being at the far right, where our older tamariki aged 10 to 14 are much more likely to sustain a serious injury due to unintentional hanging or strangulation. And as you can see represented here, 41% of these hospitalizations were due to choking on food, so they were the highest, 32% uh, from choking on other objects, and 15% of these injuries were due to the inhalation of gastric contents, which covers instances where a little one inhales their own reflux, acid, uh, mucus, or vomit. Okay, so here we have a data set comparison between our data from 2008 to 2012, represented in purple, and our more recent data from 2013 to 2017, represented in pink. It's great to see that over the last decade, hospitalization rates from choking, strangulation and suffocation have decreased. Now, sudden unexpected death in infancy, known as SUDI, and sudden unexpected death which covers tamariki older than one year old whose deaths fall into this category, are often linked to suffocation. In this particular webinar, uh, we won't be presenting SUDI data. However, later in the year, Safe Kids will be teaming up with uh, Hapai Te Hawara to offer a specialised webinar focused on preventing SUDI. Hapai Te Hawara are the National Coordination Service for Safe Sleep in New Zealand and are experts in the field of SUDI. For more information on SUDI, you can visit the Hapai website at hapai.co.nz. We know that suffocation is the leading cause of fatal injury and death among children in New Zealand. The death rates from suffocation have increased in the years since 2000, uh, most likely because it's now recognised as a contributing factor in many cases of SUDI. The goal of the National SUDI Prevention Programme is to reduce the incidence of sudden unexpected death in infancy to 0.1 per thousand live-born infants by 2025. The SUDI rate in New Zealand is currently 0.7 per thousand infants. Here at Safe Kids, our focus is on preventing our baby in particular from strangulation and choking, as they are the greatest risk for this type of injury. And when I say in particular, um, I mean that we're focusing on these, the, the younger ones because they're the most at risk. However, of course, we want to prevent um, any kind of, of suffocation via strangulation or choking um, for all our tamariki, uh, no matter how old they are. Now, suffocation, strangulation and choking, almost exclusively, as I've just mentioned, affects very young children under the age of four, and particularly those under one year old. 
Excluding sodium related data, the most common causes of suffocation related injuries are caused by choking on food or other objects. As is the trend for most of our home injury data, suffocation injuries disproportionately affect both males uh, and Māori and Pacific tamariki. The bed or place that they are sleeping is one of the most likely places for a little one to suffocate. So it really is crucial that we do our best to ensure that sleeping areas are safe for Pepe and Tamariki. Okay, so here we're looking at all home injury data that resulted in the death of a child in Aotearoa, New Zealand from our most recent data set. From 2011 to 2015, 188 children aged 0 to 14 years of age died as a result of an unintentional injury at home. And 90% of these injuries that resulted in deaths were tamariki aged four years and under, 90%. In the purple section over here, uh, we can see that of those 188 deaths, 12 were re directly related to suffocation. Now you may notice uh, that it says 100% uh, in purple, it says down there under the 12, 100% were ages 1 to 14 year old. So um, you may notice that we've excluded our Pepe under one year old from the death by suffocation data represented here. And this is because the extremely high rates of sudden unexpected death uh, incurring in infancy skew our home injury data. Okay, now this table reflects the hospitalization injury data relating to choking and strangulation for children aged 0 to 14 years. We can see from our most recent data set that there were 190 hospitalizations related to choking or strangulation between 2013 to 2017. There's a really strong relationship between these injuries and age, with Pepe aged uh, 0 to 12 months most at risk for a choking or strangulation that leads to a hospitalization. As you can see represented in the pink column, 89% of hospitalizations were for Pepe under four years old. Uh, just to explore a little bit some of maybe some of those developmental reasons that those littler ones are more at risk. Infants under one year old, they're exploring the world sort of in every way they can, um, but they also don't have very much um, sort of agency, I suppose, especially thinking about those really little ones like a newborn or an infant. Um, they, yeah, they're not able to get themselves out of trouble if they are in a position where they're suffocating um, in a bed. Um, and then when they're getting a little bit older, they're really using touch and taste as two of the main senses that they're using to explore and understand their environment. So they're using their mouths to, yeah, sort of get into everything that they can. Um, and yeah, Pepe, this young, they're not able to understand why it might be dangerous to put certain things in their mouths. And as I just mentioned, they're generally not able to help themselves if they are in a risky situation. For example, if they get something tangled around the neck or if they have an object that gets stuck in their throat. So these are some of the reasons that our very little Pepe are most at risk for choking or strangulation within the home and why it's so important that as caregivers, we take every precaution to reduce these risks for our little ones. Right, we're going to play a video now, uh, just looking at how we can ensure that food is prepared in a way that doesn't pose a risk for little ones. Babies and children can choke on food at any age, but those under five are at higher risk and especially children and babies under three. Textures and shapes of some foods mean they're more likely to cause choking. You can make some of these foods safer by changing the texture or removing the parts that can cause choking. Try finely grating carrot and apple, or you can cook them until they're soft. Take pips and stones out. Mash or chop and add to other foods. Take stringy bits out of vegetables like silver beet. Some foods to avoid are whole nuts and large seeds like pumpkin and sunflower seeds and popcorn. Cool, so yeah, that gives a, a really nice sort of overview of some of the ways that we can very practically uh, use use sort of the um, the way that we prepare food to help prevent choking um, for our little ones. So we're just shortly going to go through a food choking checklist. I'm just looking at those different types of food that may pose particular risk for little ones. Um, so 
first of all, thinking about those small and hard foods um, that might be difficult for children to bite or chew, and they include nuts, large seeds, popcorn husks, raw apple, uh, carrot, and celery. Thinking about small round foods that can get stuck in children's throats, uh, that might include grapes, berries, raisins or sultanas, peas, watermelon seeds, uh, and of course lollies. Uh, another risk factor for food is if they have sort of skins or leaves that are difficult to chew. So that might include sausages, lettuce, uh, chicken or nectarines. Um, Another, another sort of interesting one to be mindful of is food that can swash, uh, sort of squash down into the shape of your baby's throat and get stuck. For example, hot dogs, sausages, pieces of cooked meat. But yeah, thinking about um, thick paste as well. So for example, peanut butter or chocolate spreads, they can sort of get stuck in the back of um, the back of the throat or like the roof of the mouth. And a little one might not sort of have the ability to actually um, get that get that out or swallow that down properly. I mean, it can be, yeah, a bit scary for, the, for those little ones. Um, another type of food that's important to be mindful of is uh, are those sort of fibrous or stringy foods that might be difficult for children to chew. For example, celery, raw pineapple, um, or sort of pithy mandarin uh, segments like that might get sort of stuck um, in the throat as well and be a little bit tricky, uh, tricky to chew. Okay, um, right, so just thinking about, uh, yeah, the fact that, I don't know, chances are that you, you may even know someone who's had a personal experience with either a child choking or nearly choking on an object. So after food, this is the second most likely uh, way that a child might experience um, choking. Children under the age of three, as we've mentioned, are at the highest risk for choking um, due to their small earways, the underdeveloped ability to chew, and also their propensity to explore items with their mouth. Luckily, there are things that we can do as caregivers to reduce the risk that this will happen in your home. Now, the product safety standard provides information and dimensions to measure whether toys or toy parts are too small. Um, and if a toy or part of a small uh, toy, toy sorry, is smaller than the, the small parts cylinder here, which is used as a measurement, um, then it won't meet those product safety standards. Um, another thing that we can use to sort of get a bit of a sense of, you know, what might be a, a size of something that would be a choking hazard is to use a toilet roll or a paper towel roll um, and see if, if something would fit through there, then it potentially does pose a choking hazard for a little one. Um, yeah, but I'd, I'd always sort of, I'd say to be, you know, to they're on the side of caution, so, uh, you know, if it's just a tiny bit bigger, um, then, you know, maybe just making sure that, that that's kept out of the way until, the, um, until your little one is a bit older and able to make sense of what may or may not be dangerous. So, um, yeah, in order to reduce the risk of children injuring themselves by choking while playing with a toy, children's toys must be of a specified size and contain no small parts that break off easily. And these rules apply to toys uh, that are manufactured, designed, labelled or marketed for use by children up to and including 36 months of age. All right, here are some key ways to reduce choking hazards in your home. Firstly, uh, we'd recommend that you examine your home from your child's viewpoint. So you can get down on your hands and knees, um, sort of at their height and see what might be in their grasp and what might look interesting to them. Secondly, try to only have toys around that are recommended for your child's current age. This, of course, can be tricky when you've got older siblings around um, or, yeah, or, or kind of older, um, older kids, part of the whanau, who are coming in and out of the whare. Um, but, yeah, do try and keep smaller toys that belong to older siblings uh, secured and out of reach of younger children. Thirdly, we want to think about toys or objects that may be appealing for those for kids under three years to play with um, and just ensure that they don't offer a choking hazard. And fourth and finally, um, our recommendation is to learn first aid and CPR skills if you're able to, um, as that's a really great way to feel prepared for a situation where someone is choking. I know for myself, it's made a huge difference having first aid training and knowing that I at least have the basic knowledge to know what to do in a situation where someone needs immediate help um, while an ambulance is on the way. 
So just going to take you through some basic sort of first aid recommendations. Um, and yeah, please do make sure that you, um, you always do call 111 as, as soon as possible if you suspect that a child is choking or having trouble breathing. Well, you may be able to help them yourself. It could get to the point where medical attention is required. So always better to, um, yeah, to get the ambulance on the way. Now, while it may feel really scary for you and the baby or child that you're with, if you can encourage them to relax, it may help them to dislodge the object themselves because um, then their muscles aren't all tensing up. They'll be able to cough, it, uh, to cough it up or swallow it down. Now, if the airway is completely obstructed and the child is conscious but not able to breathe, you can follow these steps while the ambulance is on its way. So this is some basic first aid. Um, so firstly, uh, slap them firmly between the shoulder blades. Use firm, hard slaps. If they are not breathing, it is more important to dislodge the object than worry about a possible bruise or broken bone, as reduced oxygen can cause severe brain damage or death in a matter of minutes. Uh, a good, firm first slap is most important, as they will not be tensing their body in anticipation, so it's more likely to dislodge the object. If this does not dislodge the object, use chest thrusts, as is um, written out here, to give you some sort of uh, detailed information on how to do that, um, to try and dislodge the object. So you can alternate these techniques um, to until the object dislodges. However, if the object is still not dislodging and they are losing consciousness, uh, the recommendation is to perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth CPR until the ambulance arrives. So yeah, really important that, that the ambulance is on its way. Now, for those without first aid training, uh, and maybe even for those with, this can all seem a bit scary and overwhelming. I know for me, it's one of my biggest fears is um, having a little one that I'm, that I'm looking after uh, choke. Uh, yeah, but I, I mean, for, for myself, I've really found that um, having first aid sort of knowledge and keeping that refreshed uh, does provide uh, a bit of sort of security or, or peace of mind that at least I, I have that. So um, if you're able to do that, then awesome. Um, another great action that you can really easily take is to download a first aid app. So both uh, St. John's and Red Cross have great first aid apps, uh, which have really easy step-by-step -step instructions for what to do in a medical emergency. Um, and I've personally found that to be really reassuring, having those easily accessible on my phone. Okay, um, yeah, so I guess just sort of overall, uh, it's, it's about knowing the risks and just adding to our kite of knowledge about how to keep our pipi and tamariki safe when they are with us in the home. <laughs> Uh, Shaila for that presentation. I think that was an awesome tip, especially around using a toilet paper roll or um, a hand roll uh, to use as a guide. I think most of us have those at home anyway. Uh, so what we'll do now is we'll go into the question and answer section with Mo next to me here as well as Shaila. If you do have any questions, please put them through into the Q&A function if you're on Zoom and the uh, comment section in our Facebook Live. Uh, so the first question is, at what age uh, can we start giving whole pears and apples to our young kids? Mm, good question. So at what age can we start giving whole pears and apples to our kids? Uh, so a few different considerations, such as how they're being prepared. Um, so uh, I, I imagine Mo will speak to that shortly. But um, yeah, and that, uh, something to sort of bear in mind is to, if you if you are able to sort of access uh, resources such as maybe a, a Plunkett nurse doing home visits, um, that can be a great way of getting uh, sort of, yeah, information and recommendations that is specifically uh, for, you know, for your situation, for the little ones that you have in your home. So that can be something to draw on if you are able to. Uh, thanks, Shaila. Um, I guess it varies from child to child. And uh, I think the general rule is any whole food such as apples or pears or, or, or food like that should be avoided, you know, uh, when ch uh, children are three years and under. So the general rule is in children under four should be having um, those types of foods. But if they are, they should be prepared in certain ways, whether they are mashed, grated, or, or thinly sliced. 
Awesome. Thank you to both. Uh, so if there are any other questions um, that come to you later on, please feel free to send them through to our website or any of our social medias, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. Uh, what I'll do before I close off is, are there any final thoughts from either you, Mo, or Shaila? Um, yeah, I just could mention that uh, we have our final webinar um, for this series uh, on Tuesday the 16th of July. So love to see you there. Uh, so it's a burns prevention webinar um, with the same team that we've been uh, with so far. Um, so I'll be presenting and we'll have one of the awesome other uh, Safe, Safe Kids team members um, yeah, with us as well as, um, as Mo. So that is 10 o'clock a.m. on Tuesday the 16th of July. Um, and it's also the Australasian Burns Prevention Month. So do stay tuned to our social media channels for more information during June.